Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Cinemologists. This past year, the film industry suffered a great loss. After a lifetime of incredible innovation and adventure, special effects legend Ray Harryhausen passed away at the age of 92. His influence on cinema cannot be underestimated. It all began in 1933 when a 13-year-old Ray Harryhausen went to the movie theater to take in the latest Hollywood blockbuster, King Kong. The boy was absolutely awestruck by the film, specifically the groundbreaking special effects created by movie magic pioneer Willis O'Brien. It was on that night that Harryhausen resolved to turn his fandom for the movies into something greater and become an artist in the medium himself. Kong and his fellow Skull Islanders were brought to life using the process of stop motion, a laborious process by which a series of still photographs, typically of a figure with a posable metal skeleton or armature, is animated to simulate movement. Upon discovering the secret of how King Kong was made, Harryhausen set to work creating his own films in the family tool shed. Though rough around the edges, these early works are nothing short of astonishing, hinting at the genius that was to come. His hard work eventually brought him a job in the film industry, working with George Powell's puppet tunes, on military films with Frank Capra during World War II, and finally alongside his idol Willis O'Brien on the hugely successful follow-up to King Kong, Mighty Joe Young. O'Brien left much of the hands-on work to Harryhausen, and the film depicts a much more polished and ambitious effects show than even the original King Kong had. After this, Harryhausen struck out on his own to helm the effects for four incredibly enjoyable sci-fi horror films from the 1950s, my favorite being 20 Million Miles to Earth. This is due to its lead character, the tragically misunderstood alien monster, the Emir. Harryhausen's animation prowess shows a vulnerable and sympathetic creature out of its element, in a world where it simply cannot coexist with its surroundings. It's this added complexity in the animation that lends the film a depth that a typical B-movie plot might otherwise have glossed over. From here, Harryhausen's filmography grew more epic with each project. Greek myths, prehistory, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells adaptations, cowboys versus dinosaurs, nothing seemed impossible for Harryhausen and his incredible dynamation process, which is what his blend of stop motion and other special effects trickery was dubbed in marketing. Although he never directed any of the feature films for which he is so well known, his creatures remain the stars. They could be funny, scary, complex, charismatic, mysterious, whatever the story called for. These animated creatures were unforgettable to behold. And thankfully, Harryhausen's work hasn't gone unnoticed. He's received countless accolades, including an honorary Oscar, and the debt so many younger filmmakers and special effects artisans owe to him has been referenced time and time again. Some people say Casablanca or Citizen Kane. I say Jason and the Argonauts is the greatest film ever made. Furthermore, even in an age of cynicism and digital mush, young people are still discovering and enjoying Harryhausen's work. While some of his creations show incredible realism, Harryhausen himself never sought total realism in his special effects. Fantasy is essentially a dream world, an imaginative world, and I don't think you want it quite real. Instead, his work shares a poetic kinship with the myths that he so often adapted for the cinema. Medusa, a woman with snakes for hair that turned men into stone just by her gaze, simply could not exist in the real world. Only through legends and the suspension of disbelief by those who heard them could she come to life. In the same way, Harryhausen's creatures, manipulated by hand 24's painstaking times per second of film, couldn't move in reality without the storytelling prowess of a special effects master. Only when the film is wound back and projected at normal speed does the myth come to life, and only through the belief of the audience does it all become real on screen, just like the legends of old. For newcomers to Harryhausen's work, there are plenty of fantastic jumping on points. You really can't go wrong with classics like Jason and the Argonauts, Mysterious Island, or Clash of the Titans. They're all wonderful films that represent the pinnacle of the man's career. But if I may, I would humbly suggest that you start with my personal favorite Ray Harryhausen movie, 1973's The Golden Voyage of Sinbad. This is the second in a trilogy of Sinbad films, beginning with 1958's The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad and ending with Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger in 1977. So you may be wondering why I would recommend starting with this one. After all, you don't watch The Empire Strikes Back before Star Wars, or The Two Towers before The Fellowship of the Ring. Well, in the case of Sinbad, these three films are entirely standalone features. The casts are completely different, there is no real story continuity to speak of, and aside from Harryhausen and producer Charles H. Schneer, the only name associated with all three films is that of the legendary sailor himself. With all that said, both films are great fun, and I definitely recommend them, especially Seventh Voyage, but you don't have to have seen them in order to enjoy the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. And enjoy it you shall, because it is a blast. There's an exciting story, a fun cast, a cool villain, exotic locales, and of course those wonderful, wonderful creatures. It's the perfect adventure movie to watch on a Saturday afternoon with a bottomless bowl of popcorn. Except, no substitutes. 
As for the plot, it's your classic fantasy tale. After discovering a golden map piece to the magic fountain of destiny, Sinbad is tasked by the mysterious vizier to sail to the fountain's location on the lost continent of Lemuria. But it won't be easy for the heroic sailor, as an evil sorcerer named Korra also desires the powers of the fountain, which include youth, a shield of darkness, and a crown of untold riches. And so, joined by his faithful crew, the vizier, and the slave girl Mariana, quite literally the girl of his dreams, Sinbad sets sail to face Korra and an undiscovered country of hostile natives and deadly giant monsters. With a simple setup like that, there's plenty of room for Harryhausen to work his movie magic, and the screen is jam full of whiz-bang effects, mythic creatures, and plenty of non-stop action. Compared to the storybook visuals in The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, the look of this film is gritty and natural, drawing the audience into the universe and helping a great deal to suspend disbelief when the fantasy elements appear. Now you may be wondering why, out of all his varied and wonderful films, I would single out The Golden Voyage of Sinbad as my favorite Ray Harryhausen movie, and the reason's quite simple. It's the Ray Harryhausen movie that I would enjoy the most, even if he didn't do the special effects for it. In other words, the creatures and effects are a big part of why I love the movie, but they're just that, a part of why I love the movie. And a lot of that comes down to great casting. Speaking of, what better place to start than with a titular sailor himself? More so than Kerwin Matthews before him and Patrick Wayne to follow, John Philip Law is for me the definitive cinematic version of Sinbad. Dark, handsome, clever, windblown by the squalls of an ancient Arabian sea and always ready for action, with a turban as iconic as Indiana Jones as Fedora or James Bond's tuxedo. That is how you do Sinbad on screen. For those familiar with Law's stoic performances in Barbarella and Danger Diabolic, you might be surprised at how laid back and natural he is here, really selling the down-to-earth and well-traveled persona of an experienced sailor. Every voyage has its own flavor. The film's main heroine, the mysterious slave girl Mariana, is portrayed by Caroline Monroe. Uh, though her character is typical of most female roles in this type of film, Monroe's lovable personality shines through and adds a lot to the movie. Now any fantasy film worth its salt has got to have a good villain, and this movie delivers in spades. The antagonist here is Kura, played by Tom Baker, a sorcerer with a formidable mastery of the dark arts. Menacing, determined, and always a real threat to our heroes, Tom Baker haunts the screen with his intensely weird eyes and deep voice, always chanting some kind of despicable incantation. Oh gods and demons of darkness! Rid me forever of this enemy who stands between me and my destiny! In fact, Kor's use of magic really sets Golden Voyage apart from the other Sinbad films. In the seventh voyage of Sinbad, the evil magician's powers are vague and undefined, without any real consequences involved in his spell casting, making his abilities seem more godlike and therefore hard for us as an audience to understand. In this film, however, Kor's magic has both limitations and consequences. When he calls upon the dark arts, it drains his life away. This rule of magic is very important story-wise, because it gives his character a clear and desperate motive for wanting to find the fountain and its prize of youth. It also helps to define the limits of his powers, making him a more human and thus interesting villain. Then there's the Vizier, played by Douglas Wilmer, the disfigured monarch who tasks Sinbad with a great adventure. He spends most of the film in a golden mask, and though it's a simple touch, I always thought his character's look gives a sense of majestic mystery to the film, and the culmination of his character arc, which I won't spoil here, is what makes the ending so satisfying for me. The amiably fun crewmen aboard Sinbad's ship round out the entertaining ensemble. Don't worry. I always trust in Allah! Oh! But tie up your camel! <laughs> so those are the human characters, and now it's time for the Ray Harryhausen Monster Roll Call. The first stop-motion beastie we see in the film is the bat-like homunculus, a creature fashioned by Kor as a messenger and spy who causes no end of trouble for our heroes. Later, the figurehead of Sinbad's ship comes to life, again the result of Kura's magic, giving us an exciting struggle at sea. But these are only a taste of what faces the characters when they reach the lost continent of Lemuria. This land is home to the terrifying centaur, a creature the barbarian locals worship as a deity. Just human enough to be unsettling, this monster is given a memorably scary introduction, with moodily foreboding lighting and the echoing trot of cloven hooves. Also, that roar it lets out is guaranteed to haunt your dreams. <laughs> One of my favorite monsters is the Griffin, defender of the Fountain of Destiny. I've always thought the look of this mythical creature, half bird and half lion, was a cool one, and seeing Ray Harryhausen bring it to life as a heroic beast is a real treat. Korra's villainy factor is also ramped up when he disables the creature in its fight against the centaur. The most impressive monster, however, is a six-armed statue of the Indian goddess Kali. In this scene, it starts off looking like Korra is going to battle Sinbad himself, but then this happens. Death, Kali. Death to our enemy. Huh? 
resulting in one of the coolest sword fights I've ever seen. It's impressive on so many levels, especially when you realize how stop motion is done. The live action actors had to tirelessly rehearse with three swordsmen strapped together so that they could essentially shadow box with a six armed creature that they couldn't even see, and following that, Ray Harryhausen had to animate the creature to match the background plate. Doing that with a normal two armed humanoid creature is difficult enough, but Harryhausen had to tediously move all six arms a frame at a time to complete the fight scene. See, stop motion isn't really something that you can do, take a break from, and then come back to you later. It requires no distractions. If someone walked into the animation studio, or he had to answer the phone while in the middle of a shot, Harryhausen would have to remember exactly which arm was doing which task at that specific moment so he could keep on working. The amount of complexity that went into the sequence is astounding, and it's truly the mark of a master when it looks this fluid and seamless. For me, the Kali Duel ranks right up there with the skeleton fight from Jason and the Argonauts as one of Ray Harryhausen's best action sequences. But, however magnificent the monsters are in Golden Voyage of Sinbad, we can't forget the other great special effects either. The film's miniature sets open up the $980,000 film considerably, especially in the underground temple scene and most memorably in the Fountain of Destiny, a location realized extensively with miniatures. It's also interesting to note that this is one of the few Ray Harryhausen movies not to feature a creature battle as its finale. Instead, Sinbad's fight with Korra in a shield of darkness, a special effects showcase to be sure, caps off the film. This is a good example of what I was talking about earlier, with regards to why this is my favorite Ray Harryhausen movie. The monsters are indispensable to the film, yes, but the human conflict and adventure are ultimately the heart of the story, and that's the note it goes out on. Ray Harryhausen once said that the character of Sinbad was the personification of adventure, and that certainly comes through in The Golden Voyage. Ever since the film premiered in 1973 up to this very day, the film invites the audience into a world of magic, mystery, discovery, adventure, and romance. I strongly recommend that you answer that call. This has been Joel Davidson for The Cinemologist saying, see you next time. Allah, tie up your camel.